Well, good morning, church. Is this not the greatest place to be right now on a Sunday morning just with uh, other believers in Christ, uh, just being the hands and feet of Jesus? Uh, you know, this morning uh, as we were getting ready to play uh, for practice, uh, it's amazing with, with students as they are learning their, their craft, learning their instruments, uh, butterflies start to appear in the stomach, you know, uh, especially if you already have a thing about not being up here in front of people where people can see you. Uh, it, gets, it gets to be a little nerve-wracking. So this morning, for, for all the students that have stage fright, let's give them a hand this morning. Good job, you guys, leading us into, the, into worship. Uh, well, this morning we're going to do a quick recap of Camp Caswell, and it's really hard to condense it down to a, a short uh, time frame because there was so much that happened, uh, a lot of great things, uh, a lot of things that, uh, is, uh, as I looked over and saw the kids uh, doing stuff, and they're like, you know what, there wasn't a rule that said we couldn't do this, so Caswell needs to up their game with their rules. So uh, next year there's going to be new rules at Caswell. Uh, thanks, Trading Ford Youth Group. Uh, but no, we, uh, we, uh, we had a great time. We saw God move. We also saw the enemy moving as well. So anytime that the Holy Spirit is moving and God is moving within a body of believers, you know that the enemy hates that, and he's going to do everything he can to just get rid of that. So we actually, as the youth leaders, we were praying uh, every single night when we did our small group thing, we pray, God, do not let distractions enter this place. Keep the enemy out. Uh, only you can do that, not us by our power, but only God alone can keep uh, the enemy at bay. And, and those are the prayers that were constant because it was a constant battle. Uh, so with that said, uh, we, we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of lives being impacted, and uh, we had the, the normal Camp Casual experience that went on, but we also went beyond that uh, with some individuals uh, being uh, kind of pursued in a sense, by, by God and His grace and His mercy. But uh, with all that said, I'm going to let the students, a uh, few of the students talk uh, this morning, and we're going to hear from a youth leader as well. Um, but this morning, uh, Arizona, if you would come and give us a little bit of your experience at Caswell this year. Hey. I mean, I can tell you, I can go 30 minutes about this. So I looked at my notes, I'm like, what am I going to say? It's about 30 minutes, but I'm going to shorten it. <laughs> Basically, it was Wednesday night, and Trevor, I love hearing his word, well, what he has to say about God. And on Wednesday, it was the horror of unforgiveness. And with things that happened today, and especially my past, I hold a lot of unforgiveness. And I looked at a few passages and I read more on it, but I never actually got into depth with it. But then he preached about it, and he relates it to weirdest things. He relates it to phrases, movies, but this night he said, this was a phrase he used. He said, your wrath will twist you like a wreath and leave you like a wraith. And if you don't know, a wraith is a spirit or a ghost. And they're known to be here because they have something they need to deal with with the living and stuff so they're just hanging around with that unforgiveness in their heart and that really touched on me and it also says the devil hates sacrificial love and I'm sorry and I forgive you will raise the dead and resist the devil and then there's a few more uh, passages that I can't say right now because I'm condensed a little bit so if you ever want to hear them I'm here so if you, <laughs> I'm here <laughs> Next. Do I need to call someone out? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Oh, that was very loud. I'm really sorry. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Mackenzie. Um, so I don't have uh, notes or anything. We're just going to wing it, but it's cool. All right. So part of the things, like one of the things that I loved so much is how you could just like just see God working in everyone's lives, whether it was like something minuscule or something humongous. Like you could just, you could just feel his presence, especially when we were at Hatch. Hatch was like, and like the, the night services. Oh my goodness. It was crazy how much you could just feel it. But, um, there was definitely a lot of times where the enemy was trying to pull us down and hold us back from really giving our, uh, just opening our arms to God. And there was a bunch of times where I definitely felt to just sit back 
and but like God just like worked so hard and he moved us I, I don't know how about y'all but man I was moved so it was good next we're gonna go ahead and hand you and wing it let's do it okay so I'm broke um like Arizona said, my favorite part was forgiveness, and after Hatch, Hatch are the night services, or like the morning service, after Hatch, um, we would do like a youth group thing at night, and Greg, well, he didn't make us, I don't know, but still, like, he told us to pray for like, like two minutes, three minutes, and then go either find somebody, or somebody will find you if y'all ever had a situation or a problem, and you just apologize. And because, like Arizona said, if you don't apologize, it, like, kind of turns you into a ghost, and it's going to be on your heart forever. So, yeah, and I also liked how some people rededicated their life, and you could see God moving through the whole week. Somebody please come take the microphone. So yeah, it's hard to it's hard to condense last week into thirty seconds. I thought about what I wanted to say, and I sat and rewrote, rewrote my notes, and I tried to condense it down. I got to page five, and I realized that wasn't going to work for y'all this morning. <laughs> Pastor Mike wants to get up here. <laughs> so a lot of things happened that week. Uh, first of all, the leaders get leaders to stand up because the leaders did an awesome job. Come on, y'all got to stand up. Greg, Lisa, Tiffany, Nate, Nathan's in the back. We had some student leaders helping as well. That trip couldn't happen without those leaders' help. Lisa did an awesome job. Yeah, everybody give her a hand again. She did an awesome job organizing this, putting it together. Just unbelievable how well organized she keeps this event going with so many kids involved. Uh, and spur of moment changes, different things that happen. Those spur of moment changes come up, and that's, a lot of times, that's the enemy trying to trying to get his feet in the door. And remember, those those church doors are open, people. And the enemy walks in on Sunday morning. He may be sitting beside you today, and he'll put that distraction there to keep you from hearing Mike's word or whatever the message is is being delivered. And he did that. But we ended every day in that praise and worship that just pushed him into the ground. And that's where he belonged. Um, it's kind of, like I said, it's so hard to condense that into it's into the time frame that we have up here. Um, so our speaker was Trevor Atwood. He spoke all week on different parables in the Bible. And one of them that really stuck with me was the parable of lost sheep. And we talk about how the shepherd goes out and he'll leave his 99 to go out and pick up that one sheep. And so many times we hear that parable, that's where we stop is that lost sheep was rescued and he was brought back. But we don't ever consider those 99 sheep and that one coming back into that community. And that one sheep, there was no power. But bringing him back into the community, bringing him back into this church group right here, bringing him back into that youth group, that's where that power comes from, the community. Getting involved in these small groups. Greg asked me this morning, I asked if I could come up and speak. And Greg said, you can go up and speak last, but make sure everybody knows that you're not a student. Well, Greg, <laughs> obviously I think, I think that shows, but you know what? I think I was as big a student as any of our students there because you learn so much. And I encourage everybody, if you have an opportunity to get involved in the youth group and celebrate recovery and the women of joy, any group that you can get into in here, the missions groups that's growing on, uh, I think there's some needs for some other groups to be put together in the church right now. Be encouraged to get involved in those and become that student. You're going in as a leader, but you'll so quickly become that student. Thanks for y'all listening. something worthwhile to invest in. Amen? Amen? I am so grateful for that. So I appreciate all of the, uh, uh, the testimonies 
and, and just everything that was shared. And, and no, it's not possible to just share a whole week in just a few minutes' time, but hopefully you got a little bit of a taste of what God was doing in that week away at, uh, at camp. And thank you again so much for those of you who gave, who supported the youth fundraisers. Um, thanks for giving. Youth leaders, thank you for your commitment and for your support. You know what? Not only are they hard workers, but they're smart. They work smart. And how do you fix scrambled eggs? For so large a group, ask Lisa Lyerly, she'll tell you. You scramble them, ahead of time you crack the eggs, you scramble them, you take a funnel, you put it in a gallon jug, and hope nobody thinks that that's orange juice. <laughs> because it looks like orange juice there, but trust me, it's not. I watched them do that, and I thought, that is so great. Not only are they working hard, but they're working smart. And thank God for our leaders and for our workers that and thank God for our folks. Prayer support is huge. Thank thank you, Devin, for helping me out. I didn't even realize we had an issue, but the tech uh, uh, support there, the prayer support, you know, it takes a team, it takes a body. And, and all that without prayer is just kind of like a dead corpse. But then when we pray, God comes and moves in power. And that's what makes the difference. That's what matters. And I am thankful to be a part of a church family where we see God working in those kinds of ways. Okay, well, this is a busy multi kind of faceted service today, but we wanted to take time to finish up in the book of Titus. So turn to Titus. We'll be looking at the end of chapter 2 and at the beginning um, uh, of chapter 3. These are really short chapters. But Titus, Titus we've, uh, we've entitled this little series Model Church because here Paul gives to the young pastor Titus some information on how a healthy church ought to be and how it ought to function, what it ought to look like, what it ought to believe. And so today we're finishing up this series in Titus, uh, Model Church, and we'll be picking up just in a few moments in Titus chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Find your Bible and get that place uh, there where you can follow along or own your uh, phone or... Um, there are a few Bibles there, or you can follow along as the Scripture appears on the screen. Let's pray once more before we dive into God's Word. Father, we thank you for this privilege to be in your house today. You are awesome. You are a God that, that saves. And Lord, uh, uh, <laughs> who can stop you? We sang that earlier. The answer is no one. No one, Lord, you are supreme, and you are never going to let us down. Lord, you may at times work in our life in ways that we don't understand. We may go through valleys, but even in those valleys, Lord, you are sovereign. You are God. You are in control, and we can trust you. So, Lord, today we trust you to speak through your word, and, Lord, to our hearts, and, Lord... Thank you for what you're continuing to do at Trading Ford in the lives of, of people. We've heard from young folks today, Lord, but you're working in all ages, and we thank you and praise you for it. And Lord, as we study and as your word is preached today, may it go forth in power, in clarity. May your anointing be on your speaker today, not because I am anything, but rather because you are everything and your word is true and we need it. Lord, it's our daily bread. May you speak to us from your word today powerfully. Do amazing things in the lives of people today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. In this study in the book of Titus, this model church series, we've 
we, we start out looking at, at trying to understand how God is just supremely faithful. Can anybody testify here today? Even in the hard times, God is faithful. Amen? Yes, he is. He is faithful. And also, since he is faithful, he's called us to be faithful and to live lives of integrity. And, and, and that is so important. And then we learn in our last study in, in the book of Titus how important relationships were. Because it's not just you and Jesus. Now, now you and Jesus is supremely important. It is, but it's you and Jesus, and then you and Jesus got to get along with all the rest of us. Amen? Here's the thing. Don't think you can just be on a plane with you and the Lord, and, and, and you're wrong with everybody else. It's, it's like you're just perfect vertically, but horizontally, you have all kinds of toxic, unhealthy relationships. No, if we are on the right kind of plane with the Lord vertically, then we're going to have the right kind of healthy relationships horizontally. Good plan, Greg, on telling folks if there's issues between you guys after you read your word, after you pray, work out those issues. That's good advice. It's biblical advice. And we took some time to understand from chapter 2 how important relationships are. Relationships with your spouse or significant other. Relationships with your children. Relationships with young men uh, learning from older men. Young women learning from older women in the church. Relationships between an employer and an employee. All kind of information given here about relationships. And today we progress into the end of the second chapter and the beginning of the third chapter. And we're going to be talking about doctrine. Doctrine is one of those misunderstood terms. Doctrine in some people's minds means dusty, dry, and dead. Uh, it, it, I, have you ever heard people that say, oh, doctrine, we got to study doctrine. No, doctrine is what we believe, but it is not dusty, it is not dry, and it is not dead. It is alive. Now, you know the problem, though, in many churches, in many Christian groups, even in many individual Christian lives, it's when you try to separate and divorce doctrine, what you say you believe, from how you actually live. That's when there's a real problem, and you call that hypocrisy with a capital H. No, God has called us to believe and then to let what we believe just absolutely rock our world. God deliver us from a style of faith, a brand of faith that has us saying we believe one thing and then our lives are in complete contrast to that. The world will call that out in a heartbeat. And say, that's just not right. And you know what? We ought to be calling it out. We ought to uh, be the same Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And with what we believe and how we live, they ought to be in harmony. So with the understanding, we're going to be looking at this last portion of Titus from the perspective of, of doctrine, what we believe. But it's not just doctrine doctrine in a, in, a, in a dry, sterile, theoretical sense. It's rather, it's doctrine in, in, in what we believe and how it affects the way we live. Now, Paul wrote a doctrinal treatise. It's called the Book of Romans, and it is deep. As a matter of fact, when you read the Book of Romans, if you'll give attention to it, you may come to the same conclusion that I came to Paul, you would have made a good lawyer because all the way through the book of Romans, he was making arguments for different biblical uh, doctrines. But here, when Paul was writing to Titus, what we find is he's just given practical stuff, practical, helpful stuff. And as we dive in, we begin at verse 11 of chapter uh, 
2. And instead of reading the whole text and then going back through it, we're going to just sort of read a verse, make some observations, read some more, and it'll move more quickly that way. Verse 11 of chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Wow, the grace of God has appeared. It's, it's amazing. Uh, yesterday we had a wonderful Trading Ford Baptist Church children's event that Sandy and I were privileged to host at our house on High Rock Lake. We had a great time. The kids, any, uh, I know a lot of them are in children's worship, but anybody here now that was there yesterday that had, yeah, we had a fun time. And guess what? We actually got to see a pier yesterday. We saw the sun shine yesterday. After a long rainy week, the sun appeared and it was wonderful. After all the, 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 the downpours and the flooding, it was great to see the sun shine. It was a welcome appearance and I'm here to tell you, there's nothing any more welcome than God's grace to just show up. I'm glad that as a 12-year-old at Vacation Bible School, I'd heard about Jesus, I'd been taught from the Bible, but as a 12-year-old, I embraced the grace of God, and the grace of God appeared, and it saved my soul. And I'm so glad that this world that we live in has been invaded by the grace of God. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now there's something I want you to understand about that. That is not universalism. Paul is not teaching here that all people are, are saved. It's not universalism at all. It's, it's the, rather the ability for all to embrace when they hear. And keep in mind, it's our job to give the gospel out and to let them hear. The good news is only the good news if it gets there in time. The doctrine of salvation, instructing us to deny ungodliness. Uh, wait a minute. Whoops, that's verse 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. This, the gift of salvation is available to all who will call on Jesus Christ as Savior by faith. It's available to all, but it is not automatic. You aren't automatically a Christian just because you were born in North America. You are not automatically a Christian because you're in church this Sunday morning. It doesn't automatically make you a believer. You have to make a choice to embrace the gospel and accept Christ as Savior. The doctrine of salvation, the fact that God has intentionally invaded time and space through sending His Son to be our Savior and to pay the, the, the actual penalty of sin that we all have on us because we're all sinners and have come short of the glory of God and Christ on the cross bore our sin. That sounds like such an ancient message. It may be ancient, but it's the one we still embrace and it's the one that will save us from our sin. It's the doctrine of salvation. Now there's all kind of complicated words Theologians would use the term soteriology. It's the, the study of, of, of salvation. We're not going to worry so much about those big $10 words. I just want you to understand that we serve and worship a God that loved us so much that he wanted to save us. That, that, and that's pretty awesome because he could have still been God and just let us go on our merry way on down the path of destruction. But no, just like was mentioned earlier, who talked about hearing um, the speaker at, at Hatch? By the way, Hatch is the auditorium. You know what? When they were talking about Hatch, I thought, what a legacy. The Hatch family funded the building of that auditorium and for years now kids have been hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ what an investment what an investment what a legacy they left but it hatched they heard the speaker speak about from Luke chapter 16 or 15 rather the uh, the 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 parable of that shepherd that left 99 and went looking for that one lost. I'm glad 
for the doctrine of salvation and that Jesus Christ still saves from sin. I'm thankful he saved me. Let's move along. i got to get quicker here. We see here in this passage a doctrine of salvation, but verse 12, instructing us to deny ungodly and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Now, this present age is not sensible, righteous, or godly. You have to admit that. Do, do, can I get an amen on that? This present age is ungodly and not too sensible. It's pretty messed up at times. But we are called to live not according to the surroundings, but rather according to God's truth as revealed in Jesus Christ and his word. And so what we have here is not only the teaching of the doctrine of salvation that Jesus saves, but the doctrine of sanctification. That God wants us to not just be saved and stay the same way, but rather he is working on us like a, a potter works on a lump of clay to mold it and make it. Let me ask you a question. Has Jesus Christ been molding your life lately? The, the point is this, that you will look over time more like Jesus. Will you be perfect this side of heaven? No. No. But if you allow God to work in your life, will you be more like Jesus this year than you were last year? I hope so. Now, sometimes we take steps backwards because we're human. You hear me? But ultimately, even with the backward steps, don't let the devil get you down. You keep moving forward and allow God to shape you and mold you and make you more like Jesus. That's the doctrine of sanctification that he's still working on me and that he's still working on you um, refining the gold he's getting out the junk from our lives and he is calling us to deny ungodliness now that's a choice we have to choose to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and live sensibly but it's the best choice it's the one god calls us to Doctrine of salvation, doctrine of sanctification. Number three, the doctrine of the second coming. Wow, look at verse 13 here. Looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus came to be our Savior, but when he left this earth, he promised that he would come again. Now, Many volumes of books have been written, many debates have been held, many, many discussions have gone way into late hours of the night talking about exactly how and when he would come and in what way, and I'm not here to solve that debate. Now, I have my own uh, understandings, I, I, I know where I'm at, I'm uh, premillennial, pre-trib, all those, I, I know where I'm at with those different doctrines, but here's what I believe that is most important, and I think it is put wonderfully well in a little pamphlet called The Baptist Faith and Message, and I'm going to quote from it, referring to the second coming of Christ and, again, another $10 word, eschatology. That means the study of end times or last days. And I love the way it puts it, regardless of what our own personal views of how it will work out. Check this. God, in his own time and in his own way, will bring the world to its appropriate end. According to his promise, Jesus Christ will return personally and visibly in glory to the earth. The dead will be raised. Christ will judge all men in righteousness. The unrighteous will be consigned to hell, the place of eternal everlasting punishment, and the righteous in the resurrected and glorified bodies will receive their reward and will dwell forever in heaven with the Lord. Regardless of what we may not know, this we know and can agree on. Jesus will come again. And we believe in the imminent return of Christ. What does that mean? That means it could be today. You know what? If Jesus Christ comes today, I won't have to worry about mowing my yard next week. <laughs> all the worries, all the, you know, the load of laundry that's waiting to be folded. I won't have to worry about any of all of, of that stuff. If Jesus comes back before then, we're going home. Amen. We're going home. So we believe. And Paul was telling Titus without even trying to give a doctoral 
dissertation. He was giving tidbits of what we believe, the doctrine of salvation, sanctification, the second coming. And as we move along, we also are, are being taught, whether we know it or not, about the doctrine of Christ. Read in verse 13 and 14 again. Looking for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. Got news for all those cults that don't believe in the divinity of Christ. He's God. <laughs> and the Bible makes that so very clear. A person would have to be literally willfully blind to miss that. The Bible calls Jesus God here in verse 13. The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The doctrine of Christ is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That ties in closely with what I mentioned about the doctrine of salvation because Christ paid the purchase price for our salvation. Aren't you glad you have a Savior? And folks, if you're here today and you don't know him, don't leave this place without putting your trust in him because he will come at any time. He could come today, and if you leave this world unprepared, the Bible makes it clear hell is a reality. You know what? We actually here at Trading Port are so old-fashioned that we still believe that there are literal places called heaven and hell, and they're real. And, and by the way, just as real as heaven is, hell is real as well. And we don't want to see anyone, anyone go there. The doctrine of salvation, sanctification, the doctrine of the second coming, the doctrine of Christ. And let's read on the doctrine of biblical leadership. Paul injects a little bit of that there. He says in verse 15, these things that I'm telling you, speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. What Paul is telling Titus is, God's called you to be his man. You speak, you speak the truth, not because of your own authority, but because of the authority of the one who has called you. Let me ask you a question. How many of you here today have ever served in the armed forces of our, of our wonderful land, the United States of America? Would you raise your hand if you're a veteran? We salute you today. God bless you. Thank you for your service. But I want you to know if you're a veteran, <clears throat> or this would be a smaller group, has anybody in here uh, that's with us this morning ever served in any level of law enforcement? Would you raise your hand? Do we have anybody that served in law enforcement? Yes, we do. Thank you for your service as well. Now, <clears throat> whether it's a rank that you wear or whether it's a badge, when you stand in that spot, you are representing as uh, uh, a member of the military, not only yourself, but you're representing your whole country. And if you wear a badge and do a job of enforcing the laws of our land, you aren't the one that has the power, but rather you have power because that badge represents the job that you are called to do. You have authority that's been placed on you. And what we need to understand when it comes to biblical leadership is I stand up here today as your pastor, but the authority is not mine. The authority is like that badge of authority that God has placed on me. And I speak God's word with authority, not because Mike Motley is anything, but because the word of God is everything. And that's our source of authority. And I stand as a leader called just like Titus to proclaim to exhort, to reprove, and let no one disregard you. We have the doctrine of biblical leadership. Now, the next one is the doctrine of a transformed life. And this is really important. 
It it ties in with what I spoke with you about just a moment ago, about how we cannot separate what we say we believe with how we live our life. That is sheer hypocrisy. And, And by the way, all of us at times fail to measure up. We, we do. I was in an event yesterday where I heard a brother in Christ. I'm just, I, I guess it's, he said it publicly, so I guess it's okay for me to quote him publicly. But, but Kevin Dupree was, was, was sharing some words with a group that was assembled to congratulate Ty and Tristan on their, their becoming one in Christ as a married couple. And he said, you know, we're sinners. And, 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 and Kevin confessed it in front of everybody. I'm selfish. At times, I'm just selfish. And he even asked his wife to attest, and I didn't, I didn't hear her say amen but, uh, uh, or, or shake her head or whatever. But the truth is, for Kevin, for Mike Motley, for all the rest of us, we, there are times when we don't measure up to what we know we're called to be. But you know what? The deal is this. Are we willing to lead a double life where we say we believe one thing and we live another? Or are we convicted to admit that we're sinners, that we're not perfect, that Jesus is still working on us, and to say, I want what I live and what I say I believe to match? That's what we want. It's a sincere desire. It doesn't mean we're perfect. I'm sure not perfect. None of us are perfect. But we do have a desire to have what we live and how we uh, believe to match. And that's what we are calling the doctrine of a transformed life. Let me read starting in chapter 3 verse 1. He's teaching, Paul is, Titus to proclaim to the believers in Crete. How they're to live their life. Okay, verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. That's how we're called to live our life. To malign no one. Okay, you you respect authority. You're subject to rulers. Verse 2. You don't malign people. You don't trash talk folks. You don't throw folks under the bus. Even maybe when a brother or sister has stumbled. Do you hear me, church? Do you hear me? It matters how we relate to others and how we choose not to malign others. Don't malign. Be peaceable. Have you been peaceable this past week? Be gentle. Showing every every consideration for all men. Are you a considerate person? Now, can you get more practical than this? Verse 3, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, not through our own works, but rather... According to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed in God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for all men. What a mouthful. What he's saying, and you know what, Greg? All of you guys that spoke, your ladies that shared testimonies, and they were having to do condensed. I'm doing condensed too. I could preach on this for a long time, but I will sum it up by saying, if you have really been saved by the grace of God, your life is going to be different. Your life will be changed. Perfect, that's not what I'm saying, but changed and different, absolutely. And Paul is saying to Titus, teach it, preach it. The doctrine of a transformed life. If you've never been transformed, changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't tell me you believe. 
that, that rings a little hollow. Your life needs to show it. The doctrine of a transformed life. Moving along quickly. Number seven. There's a doctrine of orderly conduct. Now, as Christians, we struggle sometimes because we're not perfect and we may not always get along. But verse 9 and 10 say, and 11, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for these are unprofitable and worthless. There are things that we could all choose to just argue about and maybe never come to a consensus on. What good would it do? What good? Seriously, Jesus is coming back. Our life is ticking away. You want to spend your life just arguing about stuff that doesn't matter? I, 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 life's too short. Amen. Let's let the main things be the main things. And the last time I checked, Devin, the gospel is the main thing. And that's what we need to focus on. And Paul is telling Titus, be careful. Teach these folks the doctrine of orderly conduct, not to allow yourself to be drawn into useless arguments, for they are unprofitable and worthless, and reject, verse 10, a factitious man. Now, that's a tough one. I'm reading from the New American Standard. I think the NIV, actually, the King James Version uh, calls it a heretic. But the actual meaning here, I, I think the NIV uses the word uh, divisive. Reject the divisive person after the first and second warning. Knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Don't waste your life on stupid, useless arguments that won't really make any difference in the long run. The doctrine of orderly conduct, and that is so important in a church. Yes, we may even have differences of opinion, and that's okay. I can respect your different opinion, and I would want you to respect mine on things that are side issues. But we need to come together on the main issue and let that be our focus. Two more things really quick, and I'm done. The doctrine, verse 8, of generous living. He says in verse uh, 12 through um, 14, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. And Nicopolis was an area in central Greece where Paul was then currently located. He was writing to these people here in Crete, uh, uh, many miles away. But he was saying, um, here's what you do. Uh, invest your life. Be generous and give. Diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking. And he's talking about pitch in and help them with their finances. Verse 14, our people must learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. Sandy, I'm so glad that you and I pitched in to what extent we did to help our kids get to go to camp. Aren't you? Wasn't it a good investment? I'm glad that we are investing in our children's ministry, our younger ones, to build that playground so children will be blessed and families will be attracted and they get to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are worthwhile investments. Wow. And you'll get to hear about more worthwhile investments before the day is done. It's the doctrine of generous living. And the last thing I would share, verse 15, the last verse. And all who are with you greet me. Paul said, everybody that's here says hello. Say hello. You know, if, if it were today, he would have taken a selfie with all his friends in the background. You know, greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Here's the amazing thing. Here's the amazing thing. Paul was separated by many miles. Nicopolis and the island of Crete, oh my goodness, that was no short journey. But yet they were united in heart. Do you understand? Do you realize that we are united in heart with believers all 
around the world who know and, and follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We might not speak the same language. We might not have the same skin color. That doesn't matter one bit. What matters is Jesus Christ is our Lord and we are united and we need to be a united church here as a local fellowship of Trading Ford and around the world with brothers and sisters, believers in Christ. Wow. Paul was teaching Titus some practical doctrine. Belief matters. Now we live in a day and time where people say, well, it doesn't really matter what you believe, just believe something. Oh, that's horrible advice. What you believe does matter. And let's make it more personal. What you believe about Jesus matters. And as I close, it matters because what you believe about Jesus matters will direct your life and it will also determine your eternity if you think Jesus is just a good guy he was a prophet he was a teacher uh, he worked miracles but you don't believe that he died on the cross for your sin and you haven't accepted what he did for you <sighs> it's not enough you have to you have to believe biblically just like Acts chapter 16 where where a question was asked, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was given, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And so my question for you today is, do you believe? Have you trusted him as your savior? And further, if you say that you have, has that belief changed your life? Father, as we head into a time of invitation, may you use the words that were spoken here today to convict, to challenge. Help us to respond if there are folks here today that are lost that don't know you as Savior. It's not about being religious. It's not about being Baptist. It's not having some other denominational label. It's about our faith in you. And it's that belief in the salvation that will determine where we spend eternity. Save folks that may not know you. Work in the lives and the hearts of those that do is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.